I'm a little nervous this morning. I've never, never done an ordinance service before, so I'm been a bit worried I'd forget something. And funnily enough, the most, the thing I'm worried, I've been worried most about is that I would forget to um, ask the deaconesses to remove the tablecloth when we come back in. So deaconesses, if I forget, just come up and take it off anyway. Um, <clears throat> let's just bow our heads for a moment before we start. Father, as we share this time together this morning, as we share some thoughts from your word, as we wash each other's feet, as we partake of the symbols of your body and your blood today, we pray that you'll be here with us, help us to feel your presence close to us, and um, may my words be from you, and may each one of us leave here today knowing that we have come to know and understand and love you a little more, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> It was during the reign of Oliver Cromwell that the British government began to run low on, on silver for making coins. And Cromwell sent some of his men to investigate, among other places, the local cathedral to see if they could find any precious metals that could be melted down to make coins. The men returned with the news that the only silver they could find was in the statues of the saints in the corners of the cathedral to which the radical soldier and statesman replied, good, we'll melt down the saints and put them into circulation. <laughs> and when I read that, I thought, that's not bad theology, really, for a straight-laced Lord Protector of the Isles. In those few words, Cromwell states the essence, the practical goal of authentic Christianity, not rows of silver saints collecting dust in elegant, in elegant cathedrals, but Real people, melted saints, circulating through the mainstream of humanity, bringing hope and value down to where life transpires in the raw. Without the faint aura of stained glass or the familiar comfort of padded pews, out where bottom line theology is top shelf priority. You know the places, on university campuses, where students scrape through the shallow veneer the veneer of shallow answers, on the hospital bed where reality never takes a nap, on the street where mere survival is a daily struggle for most people. And that's why we must be melted. It's all part of being in circulation. That's what Jesus did and he calls us to do the same. That's what ministry is really all about. And the scriptures clearly state that we are all called to be ministers. There is no magic to ministry, no aura, no privilege. Ministry is simply service. Jesus set the supreme example by divesting himself of all his privileges as God and humbly taking on the form of a servant. He himself said in Mark 10.45, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to what? To serve. Ministry is what you give, not what you get. In fact, the Bible usually refers to ministry in very concrete terms, very practical terms. According to scripture, it involves giving a cup of cold water, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, taking care of widows and orphans, and washing one another's feet. And we'll come back to that one later. And to do this, we have to be in circulation. We have to be involved as Jesus was. Jesus came to bring love, mercy, healing and forgiveness into the world. And to do that, he had to live in this world. The one that's pretty ugly at times. The same one that we live in. The one full of prostitutes, criminals, war and maniacs. And the world Jesus came into is the same one he sends us into as his followers. In John 17, 15 to 18, Jesus prayed, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. But instead of going into the world as we've been sent, 
We've created our own little world within a world where we can be safe from that other world, that big scary one out there. And I wonder if perhaps that's why the, the church finds itself so impotent, so out of touch with the very people Christ came to save. We've done just what he told us not to do. We've hidden our light under the bushel of a safe Christian subculture. And I think if we were to be really honest with ourselves, most of us would have to admit that we're, we're not all that comfortable dealing with the people stuff. Heartaches, hunger, fractured lives, struggles with insecurities, failures and grief. After all, these are mere temporal problems. Our main job is to give them the gospel, get them saved. Don't get sidetracked by their pain and problems. It's conversion we're really interested in, not compassion. Once they're born again, these other things will fall into place. No, let's get things in the right order. If someone is starving, the first thing they want is a good feed, not a Bible study. How's that old saying go? People won't, know, no, people won't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Yeah. With biting honesty, James asks, if someone is in need and you say to him, well, goodbye and God bless you, stay warm and eat hearty, and then you don't give him clothes or food, what good is that? John probes even deeper when he says, but if someone who is supposed to be a Christian sees a brother in need and won't help him, how can God's love be in him? Hard questions, but they demand answers. And as I, was, <coughs> excuse me, as I was writing this sermon, I found that I was asking myself the same questions over and over again. Questions like, when did we depart from the biblical model? When did we begin to forget Christ's care for the needy? When did we forget how valuable it is to be healing agents, wound wrappers like the Good Samaritan? When did we opt for placing more emphasis on being proclaimers and defenders and less on being restorers and repairers? Perhaps when we realise that one is easier than the other, cleaner, more comfortable. You see, when you don't concern yourself with being your brother's keeper, you don't have to get your hands dirty or lose your objectivity or come up against the thorny side of an issue that lacks easy answers. Thanks, mate. Take the Good Samaritan whom we just mentioned. Here we've got this, this poor traveller, bashed, robbed and left to die on the side of the road. And the very ones who should have helped, the religious leaders, the priest and the Levite, saw him and passed by on the other side of the road. Why? Perhaps they were concerned for their own safety. And let's be fair, that was a legitimate concern, wasn't it? This was a dangerous place. But I think there's more to it than that. I think perhaps they felt that it was almost beneath them, below their station, to help this man and get their hands dirty. After all, they had more important things to do, didn't they? They were about God's work. Ellen White sheds a bit of light on this in Christ's Object Lessons when she says that these two religious leaders had spent years, in fact most of their lives, purifying themselves for the work that they were to do. And to touch this man would defile them. There's um, quite a bit of irony in this story, isn't there? there these two who couldn't help because they stop and help because they were about God's work. Who was the one who really did God's work? The Samaritan. The one who did stop to help was the last one you would expect to help, the despised Samaritan. And he took a risk. He risked being bashed and robbed himself. He had to get his hands dirty. He probably ended up with the man's blood on his clothes. There was a financial cost to him when he paid the innkeeper for the care and lodgings of this man. All this to help someone whom he not only didn't know, but was a sworn enemy. 
Why did he do it? Pretty simple, really. Luke 10.33 gives us the answer. Why did he do it? When he saw him, he had what? Compassion on him. That's right. <clears throat> I love what Martin Luther King says about this, and I think I've got this on a slide. Excuse me. <clears throat> The first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Samaritan turned the question around and said, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Involvement boldly believes this is my responsibility. If I don't help, who will? Risky? Yes. You risk being hurt yourself. You risk being embarrassed because sometimes you might completely misread the situation. But when you determine to help someone in distress, forget your pride, roll your sleeves up and jump in boots and all. Because real, genuine Samaritans aren't all that prim and proper. They are people who are motivated by selfless compassion, like Christ, like the, the good Samaritan. Jesus demonstrates a sweet picture of what being a true servant is all about. Humility, love and devotion to God. In fact, Jesus earned the label friend of sinners. And I... I think that's a label that he would have worn with pride. I'd like to sort of um, picture Jesus' reaction when these accusations were made. Um, you know, some of these accusations. This man receives sinners and eats with sinners. And I can just imagine Jesus saying, well, hello, yeah, that's why I came. I've been trying to tell you all along. Yeah, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. It's the sick who need a a physician, not the well. And I can kind of imagine him internally anyway, saying, yes, they finally get it. But they didn't get it, did they? Some of them never did. And the fact that Jesus earned this label, friend of sinners, is truly remarkable when you consider that he was sinless. If anyone had the right to be holier than thou, it was Jesus. If anyone should feel condemned around him, it was sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors. And yet these people found him to be a true friend. A really strong affirmation of Christ's humility as a son of man. Jesus saw it all. He saw the worst of, of, in people. His heart dredged the very bottom of humanity. He knew it all, and yet nothing could shock him. And we need to get beyond being shocked and horrified by what we see in the world and get on, to walking in, get on with walking into it with the love and mercy of Jesus. When we do, we will finally realise that joy has nothing to do with the absence of pain. Peace has nothing to do with comfort. We will no longer confuse the securities of our safe Christian subculture with the presence of Christ. We will know the true Christ, the real Christ, sustaining us in the real world where he once sustained himself by doing the will of his father. We will hurt with the world, bleed for it, pray for it, just as Jesus did, instead of walking away from it. Service is a word that many people associate with thoughts of exhaustion, fear, doubt and anxiety. But in his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster states, service is not a list of things that we do, though in it we discover things to do. It is not a code of ethics, but a way of living. It is one thing to act like a servant, it is quite another to be a servant. Someone once said, and I looked this up to try and find out who, but it 
comes up as anonymous, so I don't think they know who originally penned this, but someone once said, an easy way to tell if you have a servant heart is how you react when you're treated like one. Foster encourages us to ask, what does service look like in my daily life? Like Jesus, who served right where he was and the people he did daily life with, it's important for us to look for ways to serve where God has us today. Foster suggests the following acts of service that you can make part of your daily life. Firstly, the service of hiddenness. Pretty self-explanatory, I think, that one. Doing things that remain unknown to others. The service of small things. Some of us, I think, sometimes think, you know, we, we have to be planning the next overseas mission trip or the next big event to be serving. It's not like that. We can serve God right where we are, can't we? In our workplace, in our daily lives. The service of guarding the reputation of others. And it, it concerns me somewhat that, that um, I don't think that we always do this one well as Christians. I think sometimes we maybe get a little too much pleasure out of seeing someone else in trouble or um, lis listening to gossip and being keen to pass it on. But we need to guard carefully the reputation of others, protect their re reputation, promote love. The service of allowing others to serve us. I struggle with this one. Um, and some of you might be like me. In a few minutes, we're going to go out and wash each other's feet. And to be honest, I don't really have a problem with, someone, with, with washing someone's feet. I have more of a problem with them washing my feet. I'm more uncomfortable about them washing my feet than I'm about washing theirs. But Foster makes it very clear. It is an act of submission and service to let others serve us. Next, the service of common courtesy towards one another. Simply treating people as they deserve to be treated, treating them as children of God. This may be, as Foster suggests, the service of ungrudging hospitality. There is a desperate need, he says, for people today, for Christians who will open their homes to one another. The service of listening intently to one another. The most important requirements here are compassion and patience. We don't have to have all the answers. In fact, sometimes having the right answers, having the answers can get in the way of us listening because we're too focused on what we're going to say instead of listening to them. The service of bearing one another's burdens. True service, says Foster, builds community. It draws, binds, builds and heals. And finally, the service of bringing a word from God to another, speaking truth in love to those around you. Once we come to a place where we view service as a lifestyle rather than a list of things to do, it will be impossible for us to distinguish between the big and the small acts of service. We will no longer feel the need to calculate the results, causing us exhaustion and fear that we have failed. Instead, we will serve enemies as freely as we serve our friends. And we will look for ways to serve right where we are. It may be simply listening to a friend in need, opening our home for a night of fellowship, or bearing a friend's burden by helping financially. Like Jesus, who placed the towel on his waist and knelt down to wash the disciples' feet, we too will have come to a place of humility in order to become a servant of all. Speaking of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, come with me to John 13. John 13, and notice verses 3 to 5. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing 
and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I read that many times in preparing this. Because Did you get the significance of that? Here we have Jesus. It's telling us here that Jesus was the Son of God. He knew that he'd come from God. He knew that he had God's power. He knew that he was one with God, that he was the creator. And yet here we see a picture of him kneeling on the floor, washing the disciples' feet. It's all back the front, isn't it? Here we've got the creator serving the creature. I love this quote from, again, from Richard Foster. If the cross is a sign of submission, writes Foster, so the towel is the sign of service. When Jesus gathered his disciples for the Last Supper, they were having trouble deciding who was the greatest. And this wasn't a new issue for them, was it? This was an ongoing thing. The problem is, whenever there's trouble over who's the greatest, there is also trouble over who is the least. And that's the real crux of the matter for us, isn't it? Most of us are smart enough to know we're never going to be the greatest. Just don't let me be the least. And so gathered in the upper room, the disciples were keenly aware that someone needed to wash the other's feet. The problem was that only people, the only people who washed feet were the least. So there they sat, feet caked with dirt. In a few minutes, I'm going to wash someone's feet. But I know that those feet I washed this morning probably had a shower this morning, if not this morning, last night. And that they came to church today in clean shoes and socks. When I finish washing that person's feet, that water will be as clear as when I started. But it wasn't like that in Jesus' time, was it? Uh, these, people, these guys had probably walked for miles on dusty roads in sandals. And it was a hot climate. Their, their feet would be caked with, with dust. And as they sweated in the heat, that dust would turn to mud. Um, so what we're doing this morning is just a, a token symbol, really. Of, what, of the real meaning of this. And I guess the real meaning of this service of humility didn't, didn't hit me until, how's our time? Look, I was just going to end, go to the last part of this story relating to foot washing, but if you'll bear with me and let me take a couple more minutes, I think I'll tell you the whole story because I, we're talking this morning about service and this is a really great example of selfless service in this story and um, it sort of sets the scene for what I'm going to say anyway about foot washing. So please indulge me. Um, some of you know that I taught at Carbier for High School in the Highlands, Eastern Highlands of Papua New Guinea for seven years. Um, many years ago, longer ago than I care to think. Um, 40 years ago, I think, this year, I went up there. Um, and one year I was teaching a senior Bible class and after class one day some of my the students in my class came to me and said, sir, we're wanting to run a vacation Bible school. In, this was in one of their villages up on the Darlow Pass on the highway on the way to Mount Hagen from Garoka. And, you know, would you be prepared to drive us up there on a Sabbath morning to run this, um, this branch Sabbath school? And I said, sure, that's fine. And I spoke to the business manager and got permission to use the school truck because um, transport in those days was probably still is just um, a trade back truck and everyone just piled on the back of the truck not very safe if you have an accident of course but that was the general means of transport PMVs public motor vehicles um, so every Sabbath morning for many weeks the students would pile on the back of the truck and I'd drive them up to this village and they ran this branch Sabbath school And you know, they, they did all the work, I was just the, the driver. After um, many, several weeks of this, they, they came to me again and said, Sir, can we, would you mind taking us up there on a Sunday afternoon? We want to build these people a church, a church in this village. And I said, sure, that's fine. And you have to understand um, the program at the school. This was a boarding school where these students were in 
The day started with class worship at 7 a.m. Period one started at 7.20. And uh, the teachers started with staff worship at 6.40. Um, so it was a, a long day. But, um, and so their first class was 20 past seven, but they, their last class they finished um, at 20 past, at 1.30. But then they all, they had, they all went out to work. They had to go to a work line, as we called it, and each, all the students had to work in a work department at the school to help pay off their fees. Some work, we had 90, 90 acres of vegetable farm. We used to send truckloads of vegetables to, to lay and a plane load to Port Moresby every week. Um, and some of them worked in the kitchen cooking meals and cleaning classrooms and, and so on uh, to help pay their fees. So all afternoon they worked and then they had had their dinner, and then in, in the evening they had to go into their classrooms for a compulsory study block for, uh, for two hours. And from there it was back to the dormitories and lights out, basically. So the only, and then Sunday morning they did another three hours work, work line. So the only free time their students had, really, to play some sport, to do their washing, to have a bit of time to themselves, was Sunday afternoon. So these students were coming to me asking, you know, they were prepared to give up their Sunday afternoons, the only free time they had in, a, in the week, really, wanting to go up and build this church. And so, for several, for many Sundays, I drove them up there and they went into the bush, cut bush materials and built this church for this village. A few weeks later, I had the privilege of going, taking the students back to this village and sitting on a rock by a stream just below this church that the students had built for this village and watching as, as 45 people were baptised as a result of this um, branch Sabbath school that these, that these high school students had run. A few weeks later, we went back for the dedication of the church and we had an ordinance service that day. And this is what I started out to get to. Um, when we're talking about these disciples with their feet caked with dirt, that day I washed the feet of an old man, now I say old, but he was probably about the age I am now, so maybe it's not so, he wasn't so old, but to a 22 year old as I was then, it seemed old. And I guess it was for up there because um, as, I, as I was saying to Nathan before, um, I looked it up last night just to check and the, the life expectancy for a, a male in Papua New Guinea is still only 63. So another 12 months and I'd be living on borrowed, borrowed time if I was one of them, but, um, which is pretty sad really, isn't it? Um, but this man probably would have been 60. And I washed these feet that had never seen a pair of shoes in 60 years in, in his life. Um, and they were dirty. Um, and I guess that's what sort of brought, really hit this home for me, the significance of this service. So back to the upper room. There the disciples sat, feet caked with dirt. It was such a sore point that they weren't even going to talk about it. No one wanted to be considered the least. And I love this quote, again from Foster. Then Jesus took a towel and a basin and redefined greatness. Isn't that beautiful? So... So simple, so matter of fact, and yet so profound. Then Jesus took a towel and a basin and redefined greatness. After Jesus had finished doing the unthinkable, he turned to his disciples and said, I've got it here. In John 13, 14 to 17, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor the messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's be blessed. Ladies, I think um, you're in the hall as normal, and gentlemen out in the, uh, the back room here. Any visitors, you're more than welcome to come and join in. Go and be blessed. 
Father, as we've participated in a small way this morning in um, celebrating what you did for your disciples and also for us, as we've taken these emblems of your body broken for us and as your, your blood shed for us, may we see the, the true significance of this. May we see the understand the high cost of this free gift that you gave to us, how much it cost the giver. And help us, Father, to um, bear and to share your name with honour, and may you feed a hungry world through us. Amen.